brothers, sisters, friends, enemies, and neutrals. Sometimes I quote Abraham Lincoln. He was a complicated man. You can read some of the things he had to say, look at some of the things he did, and it's almost on the plane of the angelic. Then you read other things that he said and see other things that he did. And it's like a demon. So rather than consider him hypocritical, I would use the word complex. He dealt in complexities and he was in a set of circumstances at a period in history when things were done in certain ways. And one thing I will say, in all of the reading I've done about him, and I've read considerable, I think, I'm persuaded anyway, that what he did, he genuinely inside thought it was the best thing for him to do under the circumstances. One thing he said, after the black men fought for the Union Army and helped them defeat the Confederacy, some white people were very angry. They felt he should not have issued the, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. And Abraham Lincoln, among other things, wound up saying, the promise being made must be kept. Well, I made a promise or a threat last week that I was going to read some poetry. That's not what this program is going to be about primarily, but that promise having been made, it must be kept. So I'm going to read a poem, and I hope you find it at least entertaining, if not enlightening. And enlightening if you don't find it entertaining. It's called The Divine Conversation. God and Satan sat under a tree, discussing things like you and me. Said God to Satan, how have you been? Enjoying yourself? No, Satan, enjoying myself so much, it's a sin. Tell me, said God, have you obeyed me? You know the answer to that, you made me. Good rejoinder, God mused aloud. Were you not devilish, you'd make me proud. Gotcha, smiled Satan. You made me thus. Twouldn't be cricket were you to fuss. If you had blood, I'd not make it boil. Both of us know you needed a foil. From the beginning, it was your plan to grant me a key role when you made your man. Without me to battle, you know this is true. There'd be no reason for man to seek you. In your overall plan, I'm the key. Man would not worship you were there no me. Fate you created, and fate did us join. Opposite sides are we of one coin. Man shall deem me a gross wicked elf, not knowing I am a part of your self. As sure as predator prey will be stalking, this conversation is you to yourself talking. No thing created itself without you, naught would exist. We both know this is true. There'd be no night and neither day. If you're not, if you'd not willed it to be that way, mystery do I embody and we know, but for you, there would be no me. I'm a mere chess piece controlled by your will. If you don't move me, then I remain still. Alas, in this cosmic chess game, I'm fated never to win, but always checkmated. It must be great, God, to call every shot on each thing that is and each that is not. Satan, I made you because if I only existed, I'd be all alone, therefore lonely. Satan broke in. Sorry, God, but we know my role is raising Cain, so I got to go. You so ordained it, so I must get busy, keeping things roiled up all in a tizzy, toiling each minute and every hour, assiduously seeking whom I may devour. Man worships you, but curses my name. That is the cardinal rule of this game. You have your role and I have mine. So shall unfold this comedy divine. Don't get me wrong, God, I'm making no fuss. I'll never question why 
you made me thus. All is your will, and I shall be fervent, carrying it out as your obedient servant. Thus did all start in those long ago mists, for better or worse, existence now exists. Now I'm going to get into some things that relate to activities that I took with reference to athletics at the university. And rather than tell it to you, I'm going to read articles. This one is dated January 2nd, 1984, a long time ago, in the World Herald headline, Ernie Chambers' TV stint called Football Conscience. And this was written by McMorris, Robert McMorris, probably dead now, but he was a columnist at that time for the World Herald. Since this is the day of the big game, the really big game, it's probably not sporting to talk about a spoil sport like State Senator Ernie Chambers. But the senator's proposal that college football players be paid for their services doesn't seem to be going away as fast as Bob Devaney would hope. Chambers went national with his idea last week. In an appearance in Chicago on Phil Donahue's syndicated talk show, Chambers repeated his argument that football players are exploited by money-hungry universities and should be paid like other state workers. Athletes were being shortchanged educationally, he said. Star performers, he said, were hardly amateurs anyway because they were getting under the table gratuities from rabid alumni. As a local, I'd heard all this before, but it was amusing to see those scattergun charges bounce off Donahue's other guests, University of Michigan coach Bo Schembechler and John Toner, NCAA president, NCAA National Collegiate Athletic Association. Chambers was in vintage form, managing to make just about everybody mad. Hope, there was a studio audience and they, they were very upset. A lot of women were there and they all had some little pin. I don't know what it was, but they would make their displeasure and disagreement known. Host Donahue found the guest from Omaha easy to take as long as talk of abuses in big time college football remained general. Donahue clucked in agreement that such corruption of the university's academic mission was indeed outrageous. Furthermore, he said, quote, it was pervasive, unquote. He likes that word. Since Chambers' proposed legislation, twice soundly defeated, I brought this up when everybody laughed at it, made jokes about me, a comic strip that existed then called Tank McNamara about a football player was ridiculing me. So I was ridiculed in the funny paper, nationally syndicated, ridiculed and criticized in sports columns all over the country. But there were a few who did kind of understand. And they knew that what I was saying was true. They just didn't want me to spoil the, the sport for them where they take in tons of money from these unpaid workers. But going on, ugly turn. But then, Things took an ugly little turn from Donahue's viewpoint. Chambers began picking on the University of Illinois, the Rose Bowl bound Big Ten champion and apparently Donahue's pride and joy. Noting that Illinois under a new coach had risen from the depths of the Big Ten to the top in just three years, Chambers allowed that no team could do it legitimately. If a talk show host living in Chicago let such talk go unchallenged, he risks getting hit in the head with a brick. So Donahue suddenly remembered his responsibilities as an interrogator. He tried to get the Nebraska senator to acknowledge that he had no real evidence to back his charge. Now, people who know anything about me, and this guy writing this column, knows that I don't make statements without evidence but he had a column to write. And in Omaha at that time, especially with the World Herald, attacking me was the thing to do. Continuing, somehow Schembechler was drawn into the argument. I'll read that statement by the, this columnist again. 
Donahue tried to get the Nebraska senator to acknowledge that he had no real evidence to back his charge. Somehow, Schimbeckler was drawn into the argument. There had been rumors about abuses at Illinois, he said, but he wouldn't say he believed them, and he wouldn't say he disbelieved them. Clearly, he didn't like to lose to an upstart like Illinois. Illinois had beaten Michigan. Several members of the Northwestern University football team were in the audience to testify that Chambers was wrong because they were playing big time college football and getting a good education at the same time. Chambers, sporting a winter, work, winter weight television blue sweatshirt. Oh, well, what do you know? <laughs> uh, let me find myself. Question whether Northwestern was the kind of big time football school he was talking about. One of the players said Northwest, and he was a black kid. I think they set him up to attack me because I'm black and he was black and all these other guys with the team, they filled up a section were white. Big bruising guys, you know how football players look, but nothing intimidates me. One of the players said Northwestern is in the Big Ten and the Big Ten means big time football. Chambers then extracted from the player the unwillingly given information that Northwestern won just two of its 11 games last season. The Senator said he did not consider that the record of a big time football team. Chambers looked pleased with himself. The player did not. A conscience. While a few citizens would want to put university football players on the state payroll, Chambers does make the point, and forcefully, that the sport is overwhelmed, overemphasized on most large campuses. Toner, the NCAA president, seemed to think Chambers had raised legitimate concerns, saying he was, quote, like a conscience, unquote. We ought to listen to our consciences, but it's nice to know that the Cornhuskers are in the hands of an honest straight arrow like Tom Osborne, Meanwhile, go Big Red. Those players were getting money under the table, too. And I knew the players, not all of them, but a lot of them. And one of them that got me started on this, he didn't ask me to do it. His name was Jarvis Redwine. He was married. He wasn't allowed to have a job, couldn't take care of his family. I thought that was wrong. And I told him, you guys are doing more work than most people do who get paid. So I'm going to try to get you all some pay. And that was way back around 1980. So I brought a bill to make them employees of the university paid like others who work for the university. I pointed out that the students who worked for the newspaper got paid. That students who served as proctors and whatever else in a classroom got paid. Any student who did anything on campus was paid. But the difference between them and players is that they sucked up money. The players generated money. So the revenue generators were the only ones who got nothing. The coach had a big salary. The athletic department had a good salary. The athletic director and all the other sports were underwritten by the money brought in by the players. I knew what I was talking about. But I read to you where... This reporter said he tried to get the Nebraska senator to acknowledge that he had no real evidence to back his charge. Guess what happened two days later, and this was in the Lincoln Journal. Letter of charges sent against Illinois. Champaign, Illinois. A letter of charges against the University of Illinois football program has been mailed by the NCAA to UI Chancellor John Cribbett, the Champaign-Urbana News Gazette stated. The enforcement arm of the NCAA's Department on Infractions has completed a nearly two-year investigation of the program and composed a, quote, letter of charges, unquote, according to today's editions of that newspaper. It was mailed after Christmas at the UI's, that's the University of Illinois, request so as not to shatter the Rose Bowl atmosphere, the News Gazette reported. UI Athletic Director Neil Stoner said today that he did not know the specifics of the NCAA allegations and that the charges would not be made public until after a 90-day 
internal investigation. Someday that anti Ernie Chambers World Herald will have to acknowledge, and they have down through the years since this, that I always do my research and I have facts when I speak. And that's what, why they don't like to debate me, if you want to call it that. They know that I'm telling the truth. They know that with the job they have, they cannot acknowledge the truth. So they have to write what the World Herald's editorial policy is, which is that I'm a loud mouth, a stuffed shirt, and don't know what I'm talking about. Well, since then, a lot has changed. Players can make money from their image, their likeness, and so forth. There's one young black player. His name is Decoldis Morris or Decoldis Jackson. And his name is Decoldis. So he got a job. Well, he does commercials and he's paid for it with one of these air conditioning and heating firms. And he gives his commercial. He Decoldis, whatever his last name is, and they are the coolest firm and on and on. But anyway, everybody knows that I was right. They knew I was right then, but nobody would say it. It's that lonely voice crying in the wilderness, let the stones be thrown at him. If he survives and a bandwagon starts, we'll jump on for the ride. But while the stones are flying, we'll be lying in hiding. This article is dated April 20th, 1987. And it appeared in the Kansas City Times. Headline, legislator helped to regain aid. Then the sub-headline, gymnasts at Nebraska regain scholarships after legislator steps in. Scholarships, how binding are they? And here was the story they wrote. <laughs> Student athletes are not without their champions in Nebraska, oh, without their champions. In Nebraska, it is Ernest Chambers, a legislator who has sponsored legislation that would outlaw post-secondary schools in that state from revoking a scholarship because the athlete suffers an injury. I got a lot of bills passed to protect the athletes. This where their scholarship couldn't be revoked when they were injured, they have to have insurance and just any number of things before the NCAA could take action to discipline either a player or the school. They had to follow the standards of due process, which other states picked up and passed similar legislation. And I don't use this kind of language, but an award was created by the NCAA staff members. It was called the Ernie Chambers Pain in the Ass Award. I don't use their language, but those are white people. That's the way they talk. In continuing. Last fall, Chambers fought for the reinstatement of scholarships for two women gymnasts after they were revoked by the University of Nebraska. Janet Holling and Renee Gould, then members of the Nebraska women's gymnastics team, each had a full scholarship when they suffered injuries during the 1985-1986 school year. Now, why wouldn't anybody else speak for these women while they're out there somersaulting, doing the ball, all of these things that they do? And then when their scholarships were revoked because they were injured, nobody raised a whimper. I found out about it accidentally. When I did, and you know how I say accidentally, the idiot coach acknowledged that they were not going to be on scholarship because they had gotten injured, they couldn't help the team, so they, those scholarships had to be given to others. I went right to the attorney general. He was Bob Spire. I said, Bob, and I took a copy of the Nebraska statute, which was put there by my legislation, a black man, mocked and ridiculed. The university is in violation of this law. And as attorney general, now that I've brought it to your attention, I think there's an obligation for the state Department of Justice to do something about making the university comply with the statute. I know the law. I write laws. I stop bad legislation from becoming laws. But I'm the evil person, the one that everybody loves to hate. So I'm doing good even for my enemies. When they can 
spew their hatred at me, as I always say, they won't beat their wives, they won't assault their children. But continuing. Janet Holling and Renee Gould, then members of the Nebraska women's gymnastics team, each had a full scholarship when they suffered injuries during the 1985-86 school year. Their scholarships were not renewed. They were informed well within the time frame allowed by NCAA rules. But the action by gymnastics coach Rich Walton was in violation of a 1984 Nebraska law. They don't acknowledge that Chambers got the law passed that prohibited reduction or cancellation of an athletic grant in aid solely because of an injury that prevents the student from participating in athletics. Before Holling was aware of her rights, the university negotiated a partial scholarship settlement. However, Chambers called for the Nebraska Attorney General's office to investigate, and after hearing last fall, a full scholarship was restored to Holling. According to Jean Crump, Deputy Attorney General, Gould said she did not want her scholarship back. Chambers, who became aware of the situation when it was reported in the university student newspaper, said he saw little merit in the defense advanced by Nebraska athletic officials. Their letter to Chambers admits that they violated the law, though they don't use the word violated, Chambers said. They finally said their findings were inconsistent with the law, but the result is what I'm after. That's after I put the heat on them. They couldn't just admit that they violated, but they acknowledged that what they did was not correct. The Nebraska situation involved two athletes in a non-revenue sport, yet it underscores the vulnerability of student athletes and their rights. Neither young woman was aware of the state law protecting them. See, I'm that guardian angel. People don't know they have a guardian angel. They don't know when that guardian angel puts the hands out to catch them before they fall and will rescue them, but they reap the benefits anyway. And white people have done that through the efforts of black people since before this country was even a country. Let me continue. Chambers said he was considering adding an amendment to the law that would require the school to inform athletes of their rights. Shouldn't that be automatic? Do you have to say everything in the law? But these are white men running everything the way white men do it. And it's right, not because it's right, but it's right because they do it. And that supposedly makes it right. But on that score, I think I do have a little rhyme here. If there are any women who watch this, if men got abortions and this is no joke, they'd get them at McDonald's with fries and a Coke. In other words, if men needed abortions, it would not be against the law and they could get them anywhere on any street corner, in any hospital, anywhere. That's the way white men do things. Cowardly, they run in mobs, they pick on the defenseless. Native Americans welcome them to this land and let them come here and you see what happened to the Native Americans or the indigenous people or whatever term is used to designate them. You see what white men have done, don't you? And now you see what they're doing to Mother Earth. They're having heat spells they've never had before. Then came floods like they had never had before. Now they're having unseasonably cold temperatures on top of the flooding, heavy winds. And in some places, it's still dry and the fires are burning down the forests. White men doing their dirt. The Muslims, the only thing they did wrong and unjust was to put the devil in it. They referred to white people as blue-eyed devils. And they made it clear it wasn't every one of them. It was those who behaved in a certain way. And white people know this. They're the ones who will take a specific statement, make it appear that the maker of the statement is including everybody who's white to get protection from them for themselves but I've helped more white people while in that legislature than anybody else in the history of the legislature. 
and I'll bring some articles down here. I'm going to start reading them from time to time to let you see what white people have actually written. I don't expect you to take my word for it. And if you doubt me, if there's anybody who doubts it, let me give you my address. 1825 Benny Street, Omaha, Nebraska, 68110. My phone number is 402-453-5378. If you write to me and you sign what you write, I will respond to you. If you leave a message and a number, I will call you. And sometimes after one of these programs, my phone will read out the phone numbers. They come from all over the country, so they must be from people watching this, whatever you call it, a podcast or whatever it is. I don't even use the computer. I've never seen one of the programs that I do. But after a program, 50 numbers can be registered on my phone. There are always 50 from all over the country, but nobody will leave a message. And when just a number is there, and sometimes a name, I will not return the call. But if they call and they want me to return the call, leave a name and a number. Anyway, let me continue. Thinking about getting an amendment to require them to inform the athletes of their rights. The thing that troubles me about this is that the people who the athletes need to trust most are the ones who violate that trust, Chambers said. How can they teach our students ethics when the people those students are supposed to be looking to as an example lie and cut corners and take shortcuts? When they see that, they think that is the way to go, unquote. Gould was a team captain, and it tells about the time that she did her work. She injured her wrist, then in February 1986, re-injured it during a meet against Arizona, was unable to continue on the team. Gould, who said Walton never talked to her after her wrist injury, was told April 22nd or 23rd that her scholarship would not be renewed. It seemed to me that I was blamed that I got hurt, said Gould, who is, who is still attending the university. Toward the end of the year, they were holding team meetings without us. Gould said she did not always get along with Walton and probably would not have returned to the Nebraska gymnastics team under any circumstances. That was why she did not appeal her loss of scholarship immediately. I didn't know anything about the law, Gould said. I thought getting it back would mean having to go back on the team. Before the hearing with the attorney general's office, Walton was widely quoted as having said, quote, in both cases, it was cut and dry. They couldn't compete with the injury problems that they had. We had to open up the scholarship and bring in new people. He confessed that he violated the law. And guess who the only sheriff in town was? Moi. And he couldn't get out of Dodge in time to escape my wrath. Continuing. Holling, who still is at Nebraska but not competing, suffered a fractured back during the 1985-86 school year. She continued to compete because the team was shorthanded. Quote, I was limited to two events. I feel used because the coach still used me the rest of the season. It sort of turned me away from the coach. I had competed for 12 years and I was trying to cope with that. It left me with some bad feelings, unquote. Holling learned that her full scholarship had been restored when her parents heard it on the news and called her. It made news. Nobody called to acknowledge what I did. I don't do what I do for thanks. I do it because it's right for me to do. But it seemed like the parents who heard about it might have said, well, I don't like him, but drop him a note saying thank you. None of that. But see, white people are accustomed to taking without giving back. And we are accustomed, accustomed to having things taken without being compensated or recompensed for it. Chambers has been an activist for student athletes for several years. Some athletic officials characterize his efforts as unnecessary, but less than two years before the gymnast scholarships were revoked, the Nebraska faculty representative testified in front of the Nebraska legislature on my bill 
that no athlete at Nebraska ever had lost a scholarship because of injury. During a hearing with the Committee on Education, January 24, 1984, James O'Hanlon, faculty representative, testified, quote, at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, if an athlete is injured, he or she is continued on grant in aid until their eligibility is exhausted and or time of a graduation. The bill is consistent with what we do as practice, and in that sense, we're comfortable with it. But in that sense also, we're not sure it's needed. My bill, he testified on, they knew better than to oppose a bill of mine because budget time came around and they were a bargaining chip on the table all the time. They didn't need it. They wouldn't take a scholarship anyway. And what happened even after the law? I've read it. Under NCAA rules, athletes who suffer an injury can remain on scholarship and not count against the school's limit. That's what O'Hanlon said. That was what we have always done. It clearly was not done in the case of the two women gymnasts, and it took a hearing with the Attorney General's office to settle the situation. That article was written and appeared in the Kansas City Times, not the Omaha World Herald. So here is a rhyme that I wrote when this came out. So this is helping to fulfill my promise to read poetry. And I did, I gave this to them October 2020, the last year I would be in the legislature before term limits ran me out. Colleagues, between today and the end of my tenure, I shall give you exhibits from earlier years so you can judge whether I have changed or I'm still the same. That's what Bob Seeger saying. He's still the same. In keeping with the media's practice of including in their articles about me the non-essential words, quote, the only black member of the legislature, unquote, I pose the following query as the only black member and I wrote rhymes for him every day. I ask you why it fell out that I alone felt tasked without being asked and alone saw the need to intercede, to make things right by remedying the plight of a wrong youthful pair who felt despair and both of them were white. Here's something else. Headline, Collier playing tough. Basketball coach won't reward ex-Husker Kevin Augustine by releasing him. Nebraska men's basketball coach Barry Collier on Friday defended his decision not to release former Husker Kevin Augustine from his scholarship despite heavy criticism from Augustine's father. Quote, decisions that coaches make are not always popular, Collier said, but they are correct. Augustine, a senior point guard, point guard from Los Angeles, has transferred to BIOLA University, a national association intercollegiate athletic school. The letters in BIOLA stand for Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Collier's refusal to issue a scholarship release means Augustine must sit out the first semester under NAIA rules, meaning he will miss 10 games. The voice of Irby Augustine, Kevin's father, rose in anger as he discussed that decision by phone from Corona, California. Quote, maybe it is still all about winning football games at Nebraska, he said. I thought it was supposed to be about character back there, but if that's so, why are they trying to stick it to my 22-year-old son? A coach has a right to release him, or they can hold a grudge. And I like, I, I, oh, and like Collier said, quote, make it punitive. Collier said the issue of a release never came up in April when Augustine voluntarily left the NU program. Augustine said at the time that he was burned out on basketball and would never again play. Augustine's family said a big reason Kevin left Nebraska for California was to be closer to his mother, who was under who has undergone treatment for colon cancer. Collier said Augustine also said he planned to pursue a 
modeling career and finish his degree closer to his family. Nebraska couldn't replace Augustine with another scholarship player because of this five and eight rule, which limits the school to signing five players in one season and no more than eight in back-to-back -back seasons. The Huskers already had filled their quota. So the young man who wanted to be near his mother, who was dealing with colon cancer, would be punished by the university. Collier said he encouraged Augustine in two conversations to return to Los Angeles from May through August for family time, then return to Lincoln for eight months to finish school and play basketball. Augustine declined and left Nebraska for good at the end of the spring semester. His father said NAI coaches who learned Kevin was back home began calling in June, asking him to transfer. Kevin said no until August when he decided to accept a scholarship from VIOLA. When VIOLA asked Nebraska for a release, Collier, the coach, said no, even though Augustine now is in a different division of basketball in a state 1,500 miles away. Quote, I would be rewarding him for breaking a commitment, Collier said, and encouraging future players to walk out on their contracts. Augustine's father said he has talked to Collier, Nebraska Athletic Director Bill Byrne, and Chancellor Harvey Perlman all said no release will come, and he didn't know about me. He didn't talk to me at all. In light of Collier's stance, Irby, Augustine, the father, wondered what Collier told the people when he, Collier the coach, resigned at Butler to take the Nebraska job. He told the parents and kids at Butler where he was coaching, he would be there. But when a better spot became available, he left, said the father. How is it that that is possible for a coach? And then he tells Kevin, he can't do that when his family's health was involved. When asked if a coach leaving a school for a new job equates with a player leaving for a different school, Collier replied, Based on mutual agreement, a lot of things are possible, but he wouldn't agree to let this kid go. So here's what happened. That article was dated October 27, 2001. October 31st, four days later, after somebody read that article, here's what was written in the Omaha World Herald. Nebraska, oh, the headline, NU coach changes mind, grants scholarship release. Nebraska men's basketball coach Barry Collier, perhaps with a nudge from state Senator Ernie, Senator Ernie Chambers, changed his mind Tuesday and granted a scholar relief, scholarship release to former player Kevin Augustine. You all didn't know I did this kind of stuff, did you? I'm full of hot air. I talk and don't do anything. I do things you all don't even know about. I'm like your guardian angel. When you're asleep and the demons are about and abroad in the land, protecting you and you don't even know you've been protected because you don't even know that you were being menaced. But when I see something, nobody has to ask me for help. When I gave, they, they asked you, do you swear or affirm? When I gave my affirmation to take that job as a senator, it was to do the best job that I could. And for me, that meant anybody who had a situation that fell within the realm of what a state senator could deal with, that I would deal with. I don't care about race, color, religion, sexual orientation, none of that. Because they were not the issue, I was the issue. And the issue with me was, am I going to deliver on a promise that I willingly and voluntarily made? Would I live up to my credo? Not do unto others as I would have others do to me, but I am what I am, and that's all that I am. And what I am goes beyond just doing what I'd want others to do for me. I have to do what allows me to have peace inside. The forest is beautiful, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to travel before I sleep. Continuing. The move allows Augustine to play immediately 
at BIOLA University, a small NAIA school in Los Angeles, instead of sitting out 10 games, according to the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics Transfer Rules. Collier took heavy criticism on the issue last week from Augustine's father, who called the action punitive and, quote, sticking it to my 22-year-old son. Kevin Augustine left Nebraska for his hometown of Los Angeles in part to be closer to his mother, who is suffering from colon cancer. Collier's initial response for withholding the rele a release, I would be the coach, I would be rewarding Kevin for breaking a commitment and encouraging future players to walk out of their commitment. When Collier was asked Tuesday why he changed his mind, Collier said only, quote, I just want to move on. Chambers of Omaha said Tuesday that he became upset about Collier's actions upon reading Saturday's story in the World Herald about Augustine. It is, quote from Chambers, it is my responsibility as a person as an, and as an elected official to exercise some oversight on a matter that deserves due process, Chambers said. Acting on his own, Chambers said he contacted an NU official about Augustine's situation and distributed copies of the story in Lincoln on Monday. Quote, without revealing any trade secrets, Chambers said, I was very blunt about how wrongful I felt the conduct was. And if the, if the coach was of a mind to be tough and punitive, those are concepts that I understand very well, but it would be best for everybody if it did not come to the point. I was told that given time, this issue could be worked out. And would I give it that time? I agreed. Irby Augustine, the player's father, said at midday Tuesday that he had not talked to Collier but learned of the release from the BIOLA coach. Quote, there are no winners in this situation, Irby Augustine said from Corona, California. There is no gloating on this end. We're just happy this has been resolved, and we wish everyone back there a good luck and a good season. A good season is not forecast for Nebraska. The Huskers are picked last in the Big 12 in the coaches' preseason poll. They were listed 11th Tuesday in the media poll. Now, that's what this black man that white people love to hate, just a little of what he has done. I'm speaking of myself in the third person. It's a poor car that won't toot its own horn. So you all are going to be hearing poems. You're going to be hearing articles that are read, or you can exercise your prerogative and not listen. I don't know whether you're listening or any or watching anyway. As I've stated, not one of these programs that I've done or whatever this is called, have I seen? Because I will say what is on my mind under the circumstances where I have the opportunity to speak. There are no guidelines for me here, no restrictions. And if there were, I simply would not agree to do this. And if I go outside the boundaries, I can be told, uh, well, Ernie, you know, we don't have anything against you, but It'd be best if you not do this anymore. I say, that's fine. And life goes on. That as I stated, Popeye and I, I am what I am. That's all that I am. The woods are beautiful, dark, and deep. I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. And as the canary said when he found out the door to his cage was ajar, I'm out of here. Thank you for watching the Ernie Chambers Show. If you'd like to make suggestions, email us at ewcfacts at gmail.com. That's ewcfacts at gmail.com. This has been an EWC Communication Production.